I know we sometimes kind of take our time getting there, but let's just go right to it. Turn to Mark 14. Let's go. Let's go. Hey, this is a summer audience, and I understand it. It's summer. You've been spending a lot of time watching Netflix. How many of you guys have watched more Netflix in the last week? Than, yeah, exactly. Way too much of it. Way too much Netflix. And uh, it's not good for your brain. Probably rots your brain. I don't know. I sound like my mom right now. Hey, if you're excited for school to start back, just make some noise. Clap your hands. Shout. That's what I thought. That's what I thought. If you are dreading it like it is the death of you and you can see it coming, make some noise because school is coming back. There you go. That's just a little bit of our audience. I just wanted to see where we're all at. Listen, regardless of whether you're excited for school to get back because it means more homework and it means longer hours studying at night or you cannot wait for it, like you're just so excited to see some friends you haven't seen in a long time, uh, go with me here to Mark 14 and have your Bibles ready to go and take notes. The sermon title, title of this this evening's sermon is Break the Bottle. We're going to break the bottle. That's kind of what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to talk about going from an owner's mentality to a borrower's mentality, all right? Um, Because owners think about what they have in a totally different sense than somebody who's borrowing it. I'll give you a perfect example. I'm becoming a little bit of a shoe guy, uh, a sneakerhead. Anybody else, like, you just love shoes. You're like, I know all the, the, the newest shoes that are out on StockX. I know what, what's going on a little bit. Uh, a new shoe came out. I'm really excited about it. I, I used to never care. I did not care one bit. I'm like, shoes are for keeping my feet off the ground. That's all I needed them for, right? But now, like, I'm starting to, I'm like, that's a nice-looking shoe. Here's my problem. Shoes are expensive. Can I get an amen? Shoes are expensive. Why are shoes so expensive? I do not know. Shoes, like a t-shirt, $20, $30. I get that. Why are shoes, like, $500? Why are shoes, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not wearing $500 shoes. Everyone's like, what kind of shoes is Zach wearing? Let me show you some shoes, though. Um, these are a pair of shoes a friend of mine lent to me. Uh, these, are, these are some expensive shoes. I want you guys to be able to see them. Yeah, no, I, I, I keep these, I want to make sure I take good care of these. These are nice shoes. I told you, um, the shoes that I'm wearing right now, I got for $19 on sale at the Nike outlet. Yeah, there you go. If that's your kind of shoe, $19 shoe, make some noise. These shoes are doing their job. They're doing their job. Um, but I, I do like nice shoes. I'm probably not going to buy anything like this in my lifetime. But my friend Adam, he's got some nice shoes. Like, he'll sometimes buy them and then resell them. And sometimes he gets a nice pair like these, and he's like, I'm going to keep these ones for myself. So these are the Nike Adapt BBs, and they're just really, really nice shoes. Um, Anybody play basketball? You like to play basketball by show of hands? Just by show of hands, you play some basketball a little bit? These are basketball shoes, but I feel like people wear them for all kinds of things. What is really cool about these shoes is they can lace themselves up automatically. Everybody say, ooh. These are cool. I don't care who you are. This is future stuff. All right, I'm going to put them on. I'm just going to show you. Watch this out. Check this out. I'm not going to break them. I'm not going to break them. He's actually, like, played basketball in them. So I was, like, I was like worried. Listen, you just push a button over here. I can feel it tightening them. Oh, my God. It, it, it's so cool. This is the future. This is the future. I'm just waiting on the hover cars. How many all ready for a hover car? Make some noise. It's 2019. How do we not have a hover car? You don't want the hover car? I didn't even push the button. You thought I was lying? You thought I was lying in church? No, they tighten on your shoe. Listen, these are not my shoes, so I can't tell you. They tighten on your feet. What? Huh? This is not a Nike. No, no, this is not an ad for Nike. Listen, here's what's really cool. You can do it with a button like that, or you can, you can use your app on your phone and tell it how tight you want to get. Listen, I I would never afford these shoes. If you're dying to have them, though, if you must have them, if you just got to have them, you can get them for about five or six hundred dollars on StockX right now. Um, These are not Zach Jernigan's shoes, all right? These are Zach Jernigan's shoes. Nineteen dollars, people. These are my kind of shoe. I'm like scared. I'm I'm worried about the way that I'm walking right now. Like I'm so scared I'm going to break them and then I'm going to have like 100 people watching while I destroy another man's property. This is like, I, I, I'm, there's no chance I would even step on the floor wearing these. I mean, I might. Maybe. I might. I'm not going outside in the rain, that's for sure. I, can you, I wonder if you can wear these shoes. Can they get wet? Do you get electrocuted and die? I bet you do. I bet you do. Didn't Marty McFly have some shoes that tied them sho- themselves? Did he get them wet? 
He, okay, so let's go out in the rain and test it out right after this. I'm not going to do that, but here's, here's, here's why I'm being so careful, because they're not mine. I know that i got to give these back, and I'm hoping they're in as good a shape as they were when I, when I put them on in front of you guys right now, or when Adam handed them to me. I'm really, really worried, though, that something might happen, so I'm going to walk carefully. I didn't bring any coffee up here with me. I usually don't, but I definitely wouldn't tonight. I'm not spilling anything on these, because I am a borrower. And how many of you guys have ever, maybe it's a pair of shoes, maybe it's something else, you borrowed something that's kind of expensive, or you, you held somebody, you, you want to hold it, just look at it. You get in a car with somebody who's, who's got, this is a nice car, and you're like, I don't want to get my, my dirty shoes on the carpet, I don't want to, when you are a borrower, when you are, are operating with that kind of mentality, you respect things totally differently than you would if, you, if they were your own thing, case in point. Obviously, these are cheaper shoes, but also they're mine. I don't care what happens to them. They are scuffed up. They are stained. I think that's coffee. I don't even know what it is, but like, I could care less to what happens to them. When you go from a owner's mentality to a borrower's mentality, it changes everything. $19 shoes. $19 shoes. I just love them, though. I absolutely love those shoes. They do, they do the job. Here's why we're talking about this, because as followers of Jesus, as followers of Christ, we adhere to an idea that we get in the Bible called stewardship. Say stewardship. stewardship. You've got to like enunciate it, stewardship. The idea of stewardship is this. I actually wrote down the, the definition, the careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. So I'm trying to be careful. I'm trying to be responsible with this pair of shoes because they're not mine. I want to bring them back to Adam tomorrow in, in as good a shape or better than I found them. I might get a Mr. Clean magic eraser and kind of, I don't know, that might, that might ruin it. It might take the paint off if, if, if it's my job. But as followers of Christ, we believe that nothing we have, my wallet, my phone, my, my car, the, the, the house, that we're, we're, the apartment that I live in, that's not mine. Like the, what God has given me, the shirt on my back is not mine. I'm a steward of it. It's something that God has gifted to me. It's something that he allows me to use. And while we're here on this earth, we believe that we're supposed to use all of those gifts, all of those uh, uh, possessions in order to honor God, to further his kingdom, and to make wise decisions with our finances. I'm about to take these shoes off because no one is listening. I'm seriously, I'm watching and everyone's just like, are they, are they zipping up again? Oh, I think I heard them. As followers of Christ, we believe that we are stewards of everything that God has given us, whether that's a possession or whether that is a talent or a skill. Maybe you've got a beautiful voice. We believe that God has called you, if you're a follower of Christ, to use that voice to honor him, to sing glorious praise, to use your voice to, to share people uh, with people the, the gospel message. So we're going to talk about this whole idea of borrowership, of stewardship. Here's, here's why I think this is an important topic for us tonight. Because a lot of us, if we're totally honest... We treat the gifting that God has given us and the talents that God has given us like a $19 pair of shoes. And we don't really care what happens to it. And if it's our money, we blow it on something irresponsible. If it's you know, our, our talents, we don't necessarily use them to glorify God. We use them to bring attention to ourselves. So I think this is an important topic for us to look at. And that's why we're going to go to Mark chapter 14. Go ahead and turn there. Mark chapter 14. I think we got the slides up on the screen for us. And we're going to start in verse 3. Verse 3 says this, And while he, he is Jesus, while Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, he was reclining at a table. So he's, he's that's just how they ate. I, I wish we would go back to this. You know how like certain, sometimes like other customs come back, like 90 stuff is in right now? I wish like 30 AD stuff would come back right now and we could lay down at the table. How many of you guys, how many of you guys sit on the couch when you eat dinner? You eat lunch? You, you sit on the couch? Wow. Janae, we're bums. Where did my wife go? We are bums. Okay, we're bums. I thought everybody th did that. I sit on the couch more times than not. Ugh. Eat dinner on the coffee table. Nobody does that? Okay, 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 okay. Now you're getting honest. This is getting it. Now, now people are like, okay, yeah, I do that. I do that sometimes, I guess. I, I'm ready for that to come back. Jesus is reclining at the table. He's at the coffee table eating dinner. And a woman came in with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly. And it says she broke the flask and poured it over his head. So she comes in bringing this extremely extravagant gift, something that not everybody would be able to afford, not everybody would be able to have. It's this really expensive, think Gucci or Louis Vuitton uh, perfume, cologne, if you will. Guys are like, I don't wear perfume, cologne. It's the same thing. It's smelly stuff. And she walks in and she breaks it over his head, pours it all over him. And then there were some 
who said to themselves indignantly, why was this ointment wasted like this? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they scolded her. So they got onto her and they're like, whoa, why are you doing Stop, stop. Now hear, hear me out. In 2019, if somebody walked in and just started pouring stuff all over me, I'd be like, what are you doing? Stop, stop. It's, it's gooey. It smells really nice, but it's good. Stop. This is a different culture. This is a different time. And what she was doing was incredibly honoring to God, was incredibly honoring to Jesus. She walks in, and this is the, the highest form of honor that she can possibly show him, that she is saying, listen, this is, the, this is worth an entire year's wages, the entire year's wages of a working man, 300 denarii. So if you were to take, in, in the United States, the federal minimum wage is $7.50. That's about fifteen, sixteen thousand dollars $16,000 bottle of perfume. That's some expensive stuff. That's some really pricey stuff that not anybody can get. Uh, this is the kind of thing that you've got to work for years and years and years to be able to afford and save a little bit and save a little bit, and it's gone in an instant. She just breaks it, and she pours it all out on him. And this is where... Jesus takes a moment to teach them something because they're scolding and they're like, why would you do that? We could have sold it and given it to the poor. We could have, we could have, why did you? This is what he says. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor. And whenever you, uh, and whenever you want, you can go and do good for them. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. And that prophecy, if you will, is being fulfilled right now because 2,000 years later we're reading about it. How many thousands of miles later we're reading about this woman who came in and did this incredibly beautiful thing for Jesus. And here's why we're looking at this passage tonight. Because... She took all of the gifting, all of the possessions, the very best that she had, and she said, Jesus, I am, I'm not going to give you a little tiny bit. I don't want to just give you a drop. Like, that would have been nice if she walked in and kind of sprayed him with some perfume. They would be like, hey, that was nice. Thank you. I smell wonderful now. But she didn't say, she didn't say anything like that. She said, I want to come in. I want to break the, the flask. I want to break the bottle and pour it all over you. Jesus, take everything that I have. Listen, we, went, we did some painting this last Saturday. We went over to Fort Clark. Uh, blah, blah, blah went to Fort Clark Middle School, and we did some painting. Uh, the assistant principal called us up and said, hey, we got some things that we're, we're trying to pretty up around the property. Can you guys come and help us out? So we took that. About 12 of us went over there, and we painted a couple of hallways. And, and I want hey, let's just give those folks a round of applause for serving, for being servant leaders in our community and giving back to our community. Thank you guys so much for doing that. Uh, but when we were getting started, we were, you know, we were putting out the paint rollers, and we had, you know, our drip pans over here, and then we laid out the tarp, and we're like, okay, we're getting ready to paint. I said, okay, now let's put the, the paint in there. So I went to go and open. It's a big five-gallon bucket of paint, and they had this little, like, cap, almost like you get, like, a, like an, on the orange, you know, like the orange juice thing. You got to screw off the top and then pop it out. You know what I'm talking about? It's that same thing. You got to put your finger in there and pop. So I went to the paint can, and I'm just, I'm not trying to get all five gallons at once. That'd have been a mess. I'm just trying to get a little tiny bit. I just, I just started pulling, and it wouldn't come. And I started pulling a little bit harder, and it, and it wouldn't come. I just want a tiny little bit of the paint. I don't want all of it. And then I finally pulled it, and it popped, and it splashed paint all over my face. It was a mess. And just, I was like, ah, I got some in my tongue. I got some, you know how long it takes to get the taste of paint out of your tongue? It's not fun. It was all in my hair, and I tried to wash it, and then it would just spray around. It would just kind of spread around. Listen, can I tell you something? When we try to be stingy with the gifts that God has given us, we end up making a mess. When we try to be stingy with the possessions that God has given us, the finances or the tools or, or the talents that God has given us, we end up just making a mess and looking kind of stupid. Can I get an amen? We do. There's so many people, listen, God can use extremely talented people, but he, he can also use people that haven't got really anything all that special about them. But sometimes I get to meet these people who become followers of Jesus, and they're just, like, they're charismatic, they're outgoing, they can sing, they can do everything, like, people just love talking to them, like, I'm like, you would be so good at telling people about Jesus, if you would just get to it, you, may, you could be a pastor, or you could be a really influential Christian in your place of business, and it seems like they just 
waste it. I'm like, why, 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 why would you do that? Don't, you could be so much more, you could be so much more effective. Why would you waste the skills and the talents that God has given you? We need to go from a owner's mentality to a borrower's mentality because God has entrusted these things to us and, and when we give them back, we want to give them back in the very best condition that we possibly can. When we're being stingy with what God gives us, we end up making a mess. And I look at this passage, Jesus says, leave her alone. But she runs in here, verse 3, and she broke the flask, poured it over his head. She wasn't stingy because she knew that it already belonged to Jesus. As followers of Christ, you've got to have this ingrained in your mind. You've got to have this nailed down. You've got to know this when it comes to your finances, when it comes to your possessions, when it comes, listen, when it comes to your calendar. Somebody say amen. When it comes to what you prioritize, where you go, when you go, how much time you spend there, you've got to know that all of the time you have in that calendar, it says you've got 30, 31 days. Isn't it, was it April that only got 28 days? February. <laughs> I've never heard people so offended on the behalf of a month in my life. That's February. Everyone, I'm sorry. Whatever amount of time you've got, 24 hours in a day, that belongs to God. So you've got to ask yourself, how am I using this? Am I honoring God with the time that I've been given? How many years do you have on this earth? Am I honoring God with the years that I have? You've got to think through this. These are things that you've got to start. And please think about them at your age. Don't wait till you're my age or even older to really think about these things. She wasn't stingy. She didn't hold anything back because she knew it all belonged to God because she knew that he was completely deserving of everything that she had. She said, this is the best I got, so I'm giving you everything. And she gets scolded for it. They give her a hard time, but, she, but Jesus says, no, no, no. This is a beautiful thing that she has done for me. First, John, many of you guys will probably know John 3.16. It's a very famous verse. Tebow had it, Tebow had it on his uh, painted on his face, and I think even people who aren't followers of Jesus have come across that passage before, but you may not know 1 John 3.16. This is what it says. By this we know love, that Jesus laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. This is how we know that Jesus is the real deal. This is how we know that Jesus loves us, because he laid down his life, and so John's telling, listen, in the same way, we've got to go and lay down our lives for our brothers, for, for our, our fellow Christians. We've got to take care of one another. That doesn't necessarily mean, although it could mean, we need to literally die in the same way that Jesus did. But in so many other ways, that means saying, listen, whatever it takes, I'm going to give you. It's, if it's the, the shirt off my back, it's yours. If I can take care of you anyway, I've I got a spare room. Oh, I don't have a spare room. I've got a couch. It's yours. You, 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 I've got a place for you to stay. This is the last bit of food I have, but it's yours. I want to take care of you. We've got to lay down our lives for one another. And so many times we think about our, our, our involvement in church. We're saying, yeah, yeah, I'm laying down my life. I'm, giving, I'm involved in church. I come twice a month, maybe three times a month sometimes, and I'm really involved, in, and I think I give some money. Maybe my parents give. I know I gave some money at VBS. That counts, right? So many of us watch Jesus lay down his life for us, and we think we're even or we're square when we lay down a semi-regular church attendance. God gave us so much more. God broke the bottle and gave us the most precious thing that he had. He sent his one and only son, Jesus, to die on the cross for our sins so that we didn't have to go to hell, so that we could have a relationship with him and go to heaven. Jesus broke the bottle. We got to do the same. We got to emulate. We have to give him the very best that we can. We have to give him the very best time. We have to give him the first block of time and prioritize it. We need a generation that is going to say, God, you own my wallet. God, you own my wallet. You own my finances. If it's about what I'm going to spend my money on, if it's this or that, I, I want to make sure that I honor you with my finances. Listen, a lot of people don't talk to middle schoolers and high schoolers about money because they're like, well, they don't really have a lot of money anyways. That's a mistake. Because you're thinking in your mind, God doesn't need me to tithe. God doesn't need me to give that 10% back to him. God doesn't need me to do any of those things. I don't really have a lot of money. Listen, God doesn't tell us to tithe because he needs our money. God is not like broke, saying, can anybody got $2? Anybody got $3? I would just, I'm just dying for a few dollars. If you guys could put some money in the plate for me, that's not, that's not our God. 
God asks us to tithe and rely on him for 10% of our income because he wants us to rely on him. He wants us to trust in him and not trust in ourselves. And so, so many times we'll think, well, tithing, that's like, I don't have to start giving that money to the church. I don't have to start contributing until I'm like 18. But then when you turn 18, you're like, oh, I, gotta, I don't got to do that until I got like a job. And then you get a job, and you think, well, I don't actually got to do that until, like, I got a job job. You know what I mean? Like a, like a salary job. This one's just kind of part-time. Listen, start right now. Please do it. Whatever amount of finances, uh, uh, you do some chores, you got a little part-time thing, you mow some lawns, you get $10 a week, whatever it is, God does not want you to rob him of his tithes. He, he's, he's not greedy. He's not like, hey, I just need a couple more bucks. I'm dying for this. This isn't about dro- growing the church. This is about your heart. It's about giving God the very best and the first fruit of your heart. And so many of us, we live right in our wallet. We're not living in the, in the world that God has given us. And, and so many of you are like, no, no, I'll wait till I'm 18. I'll wait till I get a job. It's going to hit you like a ton of bricks. And at some point, God is going to reveal to you one way or another that you have made something else the Lord of your life and it's not him. We need a generation that's going to say, God, you on my calendar. I know we got church a couple times a week. We got church on Sundays and on Wednesdays. But what about just on a, on a day? How does Monday reflect that you honor God with your time? How does a Tuesday reflect that you are trying to do everything you can to give back to God, to, to glorify God, to break the bottle? Does the, what's the first thing you do when you wake up? I know for me so many times I neglect spending time in God's Word. I don't, I don't read a single verse out of scripture. I don't spend any time in prayer because I'm like, no, oh, I gotta go. I gotta, I, I got things I gotta do. I got, I, I got important things to do, Lord. I would love to spend time with you, but, but there's this. I got a task list, and listen, I gotta take, I gotta change the oil, or I gotta meet up with my friend. Listen, prioritize time with God on a day. Prioritize time with God throughout the week and every single thing that you do. And you're like, does that mean I gotta go to church like seven days a week? No, that's not what it means. I'm not getting at you about any of those things. But here's, listen, I read about an old, in the 1800s, there was a revival in Scottish rural churches. And this is before, like, they had a bunch of automobiles. This was, like, back in the day. This was in a cold, wet country. And all these little farm churches were getting stoked about Jesus. It was incredible. It was amazing. And it says, so many people would write, they said, it was amazing to watch this happen because it didn't happen in spring or in summer when it's like, hey, everything outside is beautiful, let's go out inside. They would all gather from different remote parts of Scotland and they would travel at night or early in the morning to gather together so that they could read God's word, so that they could hear his preaching, and so they could be encouraged to follow him closer. In the middle of winter, they were trudging through snow. Listen, so many times, I'll be on vacation. Listen, I work for a church. I have an easy out. I'm supposed to be here, right? But there are so many times I'll be like on vacation or I'll, I'll, even in my heart, I'm just being negative. I'm like, I don't really, I'm not excited to go to church. I want the same kind of passion that I re- read about in, in instances like that with the Scottish church. Listen, honor him with your time. Honor him with your time commitments, if you've ever been in a place where you just feel like church is an obligation, church is just something that you feel like you have to do, it's not something that you, you want to be inconvenienced with, let me just encourage you, the, the commitment to your church or the relationship between you and your church might not be the problem. I really believe that the relationship between you and Jesus is the actual problem. Because you can love church and not love Jesus, but you can not love Jesus and not love his church. I'm telling you, listen, you look all throughout scripture, like the church is God's plan A, B, and C for the world. Some of you guys are like, wait, can you not? I'm telling you, you can love church and not love Jesus. There's a lot of people that come to church every Sunday that have, it seems like they've never met Jesus. But you cannot love Jesus and not love his church. Over and over and over again, God moves and interacts and, and, and all throughout these, these letters that we're, work, we're, we're reading through, Jesus always moves and operates through his church. And I understand, I can worship God on the beach, but you're not responsible to a group of people. You're not encouraging one another. You're not growing as a church. Just worshiping on the beach. 
if church is an inconvenience to you or if it's something that you're just obligated to, listen, draw close to Jesus and he'll take care of that for you. I promise you. We need a generation that's gonna say, God, you own my wallet, you own my calendar, but here's the thing. We need a generation that's gonna say, God, you own my body. Do you realize this? In 1 Corinthians chapter six, let's turn there real quick. 1 Corinthians chapter six, roll over there. 1 Corinthians chapter six, verse 19. This is what it says. I've got too many sermon notes right here. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Paul's writing to people who, would, who, who used to worship these pagan gods, and they would go off to the temple of Aphrodite. They would go off to these temp, the temple of Artemis, and the way that they would worship God was going in and out with a prostitute. That, that, that's the way that they would worship this pagan god, and this is the way that they would, they were just honoring Artemis. That's, that's how they thought about it. So all these people start coming to know Jesus now, and Paul's like, listen, you've got to stop that. That's not how you follow God. That's not how you have a relationship with Jesus, and that's not the, the teachings of Jesus. And so he says, listen, you guys, you guys are, you don't realize this, but as followers of Jesus, the Holy Spirit dwells in you. That is not just you anymore. God himself dwells in you. You're a temple of the Holy Spirit. You can't just run, stop. I got a challenge for you, some of you guys. I got a challenge for some of you guys. Next time you go on a date, put a reminder in your phone to go off every five minutes that says, I am a temple of the Holy Spirit. My body is not my own. I was bought with a price. I dare you to try to get fresh while that's going off in your mind. Well, you got the word of God going around in your mind. You think I'm joking. You think I'm joking. Honor God with your body, people. Would somebody say amen? You can't do it. We need a generation that's going to say, God, you own my wallet, you own my calendar, you own my body. I'm going to, I'm going to give everything that I have back to you, the most precious things that you have given me, possessions, finances, skills, talents, they're yours. I don't want to use them for me. I don't want to puff myself up with them. I want to glorify you with them. We need some people who will say, Jesus, I want to break the bottle over you. I want to give you everything. I don't want to hold everything back. I don't want to hold even a tiny piece back for myself. I want to glorify you because you're worth it and because it's yours anyway. We're going to discuss this in just a minute when we go to our teams. When we go to our teams, and our team leaders, you guys can start making your way back there and grabbing your signs right now. When we go to our teams in just a minute, we're going to just going to be asking ourselves this question. How Am I giving back what God has given to me? How am I honoring him? And, and maybe I didn't hit you right between the eyes. Maybe we talked about finances. Well, your finances are okay, but there's another area of your life where you're not honoring him. Maybe there's another area where you're not being a good steward of what he's given you or what he's uh, and, entrusted to you. You need to give that talent to him. You need to give that skill to him. You need to honor him with everything that he's given you. Let's just ask ourselves some of those tough questions.